Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning. Um, Wednesday, no, Thursday morning, July 21st. <laughs> this is what child abuse survivor to another. One for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And the chat room's open. I did pop the link in there to what we're talking about. And we're looking at Robert Bernie's webpages, Joy to Me and You. And Robert Bernie is a codependent therapist. He's a grief counselor, and he's written a whole lot of stuff on on his webpage is Joy to Me and You, www.joy, J-O-Y, to the number two, M-E-U dot com. And so, <clears throat> thanks everybody. I'm just waking up having a coffee and appreciate you all being here. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate everybody. I appreciate everybody who's listening to the archives. I mean, I have a lot of people who go back and listen to my archives, and I think that's awesome. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my shows. Um, I just, you know, I just wanted to be one more voice out here, really. I had seen a whole lot of great people out here survivors and people who are really trying to reach out and 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 you know talk about this stuff as well as you know promote you know prevention of child abuse and what so i just wanted to be one more voice right so that's why i started doing these blog talk shows and so i appreciate everybody who's tuning in but i'm not a counselor or therapist i'm just a private citizen so you have to listen at your own discretion because i'm talking about abuse i'm mainly talking about my story but i'm talking a lot about abuse and abuse is a sensitive subject and so you have to Know what's for you to listen to, right? What may what may make you uncomfortable and whatnot. You have to know personally yourself what would be good for you to listen to. So, listen to all my shows and any of my shows at your own discretion, right? I'm talking about abuse and and abuses, you know, can make people rather uncomfortable, especially survivors who are just on their healing journey, just starting out. It is uh, it can trigger you, it can trigger people. So you have to be careful what you're what you're okay to listen to, and you know you have to know yourself. <clears throat> you know, take take a look at. Uh, you know, really take some time and spend some time thinking about what what triggers you and what may trigger you, and be careful what you're listening to, right? And young people under the age of 18, I ask that you have permission to listen to my shows, because I'm, you know, really all about protecting children, right? This is what I'm doing, fighting to 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 promote child rights and protection of children. And so, if you're under the age of 18, this show really is is really for adults, and it's for people who are a uh, mature audience. You know, like there's a lot of adult content on my shows, so. So I ask everyone who's under the age of 18 to have permission to listen to my show, you know, have an adult, somebody who's older who's an adult who can listen to the show with you and help you make a a decision if it's appropriate for you. So thanks, everybody. We'll get right into this. Um, Looking at uh, grieving, um, this is Robert Bernie's webpage, www.joy2meu.com forward slash grieving.html. We're about halfway, well, a little bit, no, about three quarters of the way now down the page looking at subconscious programming. So I'm just going to pick up there. Robert Bernie's talking about, this is under the, the inner child healing work that he has on his pages. So if you go to the site index on his um, on Robert Bernie's web pages there, you can see that he's got all these categories. And I'm looking at the inner, inner child healing process. And so the grieving is under there. And he's got grieving examples of how the process works by Robert Bernie. And so this is what we're we're looking at here. And uh, which is because I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't know if I'm not necessarily having started the grieving work, I'm just working on gathering my feelings and, and seeing where I need to go with my feelings for my healing journey, right, because right now I'm dealing with some pretty heavy duty stuff regarding incest, uh, CS, uh, child sexual abuse and incest, so, you know, I'm still working on the process, <clears throat> so I'm just taking a look at grieving uh, as part of the inner child work, because that's what I'm working on is my inner children and inner child. So subconscious program is the next por- next portion of this. And I'm just going to read here. The ne- This is Robert Bernie. The next time something does not go the way you want it, wanted it to, or just when you are feeling low, ask yourself how old you are feeling. What what you might find is that you are feeling like a bad little girl, a bad little boy, and that you must have done something wrong because it feels like you are being punished. So he says, just because it feels like you are being punished does not mean that is the truth. Feelings are real. They are emotional energy that is manifested in your body but they are not necessarily fact. So it says, what we feel is our emotional truth, and it does not necessarily have anything to do with either facts or the emotional energy that is truth with a capital T, especially when we are reacting out of an age of our inner child. So this is what he's talking about here. <clears throat> Subconscious programming. So he says, if we are reacting out of our emotional truth was what our emotional truth was when we were 5 or 9 or 14, then we are not capable of responding appropriately to what is happening in the moment. We are not being in the now. So this is when we are reacting out of old tapes based on attitudes and beliefs that are false or distorted, our feelings cannot be trusted. 
Yeah, because he says, you know, if you have an inner child who's eight years old, you certainly don't want to let them drive the bus, right? They they don't know how to drive, and they they don't have a license to drive. Um, Yeah, so I I actually, when I started to look into this, and I realized that a lot of the decisions I was making, a lot of my behaviors were based on my wounded inner child. Um, And I didn't realize that until it was pointed out to me. Um, just through study and through through looking into this stuff, and I started to think, yeah, that's true. I do a lot of um, a lot of the decisions that I make are, are fear based, you know, fear based from this from this inner the inner children that, that that are making these decisions for me on behalf of me as an adult now trying to get along in the world, and that's not good, <laughs> right? Because I mean, I'll quit jobs, I'll walk away from relationships, no problem. Um, with, you know, just because I don't want want to handle the confrontation, and that's my inner child. You know, saying, "Oh, we're out of here." You know, that's my probably my teacher saying, "I don't have to take this. I'm gone." And you know, that's you know, it's really not a good idea to let our inner child, inner children, run our lives as adults, right? So this was interesting information for me. I found it pretty helpful because I started to take a look at some of why I make some of the decisions that I do. And uh, I have my good friend Gypsy, which here. Hello, good morning. How are you? Love you, dear. Glad you could be here. So some of the decisions I was making were definitely based on you know how I was feeling it how my inner child was feeling, right? Not me, right? Not the adult 40-whatever-year-old 40, 40 person here who's who's actually in, in the now. Um, so it's really something when you actually start looking at some of the behaviors and some of the some of the uh, decision-making processes, right? And thinking, wow, you know, I guess that was that was based on my inner child, right? So it's not a good idea. So it's good. It's yeah, well, I like what he has to say. Mo- you know, most of what he says uh, makes sense to me. This is another benefit, <clears throat> excuse me, of releasing the suppressed energy of doing the deep grieving is that often it is only in during, during the grieving that we get in touch with subconscious programming that is dictating some aspect of our relationship with life. So attitudes we adapted in childhood, sometimes promises we made to ourselves are included in that subconscious programming and can have great power, which we cannot overcome until we get in touch with them. So he says, in the first long-term relationship, long-term for me being two years, uh, I got into in recovery, I realized that setting a boundary in an intimate relationship felt to me like I was uh, being a perpetrator. So my role models in childhood presented me with two options for behavior in in a romantic relationship, a self-sacrificing martyr with no boundaries and a raging verbally abusive perpetrator. This is Robert Burney talking. So he's a survivor as well. He says, I hated the pain caused by the perpetrator, so I became a martyr who did not know how to set boundaries. Setting boundaries for me was, was... with my significant other, felt like I was being ab- very, being abusive. So this is quite interesting because this is sort of what I look at. I look at this and I think about my sister. <clears throat> my sister sort of fits into that category, right? Because she she doesn't have any boundaries. She doesn't know where the boundaries are, and she doesn't set any boundaries because pretty well for this same reasons here. I think that that Robert Birdie's talking about. She feels that you know if she puts her foot down and sets boundaries, then she's become the abuser, right? But that's because that's you know we grew up with highly abusive people, so she doesn't know how to set boundaries. So therefore, she ends up in these relationships where she gets taken advantage of, you know, uh, revictimized, which is horrible, right? And so he says, Robert Brady says, it was only when I got aware of this programming that I could start changing it. A great example of how this works is the brief case study that I show in my series in the True Nature of Love. So he has some he has some um, case studies and different things that he has for examples of um, what happens to people just to give people an idea of what they're looking at and then he says um, so you can read through those if you want to there's quite a bit of there's a lot of that stuff on here it says feeling sad that's the next one Um, this is another example so these are examples of the actual um, people working through grief, right? Grief work. And so he says, many people when they first start to feel the grief will say they are feeling depressed. What we call things has has power and it is it is important to start owning that to start owning that we are involved in a healthy grieving process instead of a victim of depression. That's quite interesting. And I think grieving is like he was saying, grieving depression and grieving is two different things. Um in in grieving you can still see you can still be happy about a a, a sunset that's beautiful or good news from a friend or something, good news about a friend or something. But when you're depressed, you can't see that sunset. because it's, it, You can't even see it. It's 
nothing's good, right? You can't be happy about somebody else's, um, you know, accomplishments or, or things that are happening to somebody else who normally a person should be happy about because you're depressed. And so depression and grieving are, are definitely two different things. I'm just going to plug in my headphones here. But my voice is terrible this morning. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so he says, depression and grieving are two different di- different dynamics. Depression is an emotional state caused by anger that has been turned in on ourselves because of mental attitudes empowering the false belief that it is shameful to be an imperfect human. So this is what Robert Bernie says. <laughs> Owning our feelings by doing the grief work, especially the anger and rage portion of the grieving, is the way out of depression. So changing our relationship with life into one which defines life as a growth process with a spiritual purpose rather than a test, we can fail because we are flawed and imperfect, is a very large step towards starting to emerge from depression. <clears throat> so he says, just be, just being able to say to ourselves, not necessarily to other people, unless they are safe people to share with, I am sad. I have good reasons to be sad. It is not okay. It is not only okay to be sad. It is healthy and part of owning myself to grieve for how painful my life experience has been. So, you know, I like that. I like what he says there because, you know, we have anybody who's been, you know, so hurt and so wounded. We all know what it's like to be hurt and wounded. I mean, everybody on the planet at some point has been hurt and wounded. I mean, come on. <laughs> you can't escape it. Um, but, you know, the, the severity and the degree and, and everything else can cause some serious damage. But everybody knows what it's like to be sad about something, you know. But so many times people are like, they will feel like they're weak if they if they show that they're sad about something, you know, that... Uh, especially guys, I think men have a real hard time with that because they're programmed to, to to think that they're programmed to believe that they're they shouldn't be showing those emotions, they shouldn't even be having them, right? It's supposed to be like a stone, like hard, like a rock, you know, with no feelings or emotions. And they, you know, so they don't quite often won't show they're they're sad about something, which makes them look kind of almost callous and uh, inhuman, right? And for a lot of other people, um, just feeling sad and I think people don't want the world to see, you know, so to see their their weakness, so they won't show their real feelings on it. <clears throat> I remember in, when I was in school, I had to draw a picture. Just thinking about that, I drew a picture of um, in, in elementary school of the house, and it, it, we were supposed to draw our house and our family um, we, when we went back to school from summer vacation. So what I did is I drew I drew a house. I drew a two story house, which we didn't have a two story house. And I drew. <laughs> I was probably wishing we had a two-story house, but um, I drew a two-story house and I put all the people in the front of it. Uh, they were all stick figures, right? Because I think this was probably done in the second grade or something. And um, there were stick figures. They all had hair like the right, like I had blonde hair and it was long. And you know, my mom had curly hair. Like everybody had had the right hair, and so they were all crying, right? This was my stick figure family in you know in front of this two-story house uh, they, and I they were all crying so my teacher was like how come they're all crying <laughs> you know like you've got your whole family here how come they're all crying and I was like because everybody's so sad you know and that when I was a little kid I I recognized you know that I was so sad you know and that my family was so sad not only was there the abuse going on but everybody was really sad because Really honestly, I mean, at the end of the day, my mom was ready to kill herself, and everybody else was trying to either, you know, numb themselves out with alcohol or drugs, or you know, the older siblings, or you know, the, my sister was living in a, some sort of a pretend world. Everything was just great with her, you know, but that's because she was she was dissociative or whatever you want to call that. She was just she was just two, three different, four different people. I mean, I have no idea how many people she really is, but I, I still haven't met the real. The, my real sister. I might have met her somewhere in there a long time ago, but would have been a long time ago. But yeah, I mean, I knew I could feel that sadness. I, I I can feel that. I could feel how sad our my family was as a child. Then when I got older, I started I started to not recognize it as sadness and really started to, because I was looking through the eyes of anger, you know, so I could see my family with the hatred and the, the evil garbage and the the horror really that they were inflicting on each other and 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 on the children, my parents. And you know, just realizing how 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 hateful and how horrible the, these people were. Um, so then I was looking at it more from a an, a a perspective of anger. But you know, that's after so many years of just being annihilated, you know, within this family. So, well, when I was a little kid, I could recognize the sadness, you know, and I and I knew 
that my family was sad, and I think sadness is something that a lot of people are ashamed to say, oh, I'm sad, or I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm just down today, I'm just sad. We should be allowed to say that if we're sad. If we're sad, we're sad, you know. If we're mad, we're mad, right? We have to be able to be emotionally honest and honest with ourselves and honest with everybody else. This is a problem with the world today. People can watch. People can stand by and let a child be abused and turn a blind eye, right? And not feel bad about it, you know, and not feel upset about it. People can hear my story and, and just walk right on by and think, well, who cares? Whatever. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and the issue is, is that, that somewhere in the back of, of somebody's mind, you know, they should be feeling some type of, of either anger, which would be appropriate, or some sort of sadness. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean their lives have to fall apart because of it, because that's that's the other side of this emotional imbalance, right? But it should affect people. You know what I mean? So if I'm having a bad day, I pretty well tell everybody that I'm having a bad day. You know, because I'm like, you know what? If somebody says, how's your day? I'll be like, well, it's okay. You know, it's not, it's not you know, I'm all right. But then... If I'm having a good day, I'll be like, "Oh, I'm having a great day." You know, I don't I don't say I'm having a great day every day because that's just not true. You know what I mean? But we do have to, you know, we have good reason to be sad, right? He says, just being able to say to ourselves, like, you know, I'm sad because I have good reasons to be sad. It's not only okay to be sad; it's healthy, and it's part of owning myself to grieve for how painful my life experience has been. I mean, honest to God, like, I mean, if I wasn't sad, I wasn't angry, there'd be something seriously wrong with me. You know, it's like, you know, I mean, back when I was in my 20s, I used to pretend that I wasn't sad and I wasn't angry. I thought it was, I used to be like my sister and quite a bit of, not denial, but just pushing it down so far that I didn't have to look at it. And, you know, I still was fighting with my mom, fighting with my dad, you know, and and, and throwing into their face what they did to us our whole lives, which I did a whole lot of that, Um, you know, when I was an, an older, like an adult, and it's still around my dysfunctional, abusive family. I mean, I was like the one that they did not want to be, they did not want to have around because I was pushing it into their face all the time. Look what you did. Look what you did, you know, making them feel really guilty, right? Because I wanted them to realize what they did, right? And so I, on every opportunity that I got, I would throw it in their face. Of course, they didn't like that, right? And so obviously I got a bad rap, got, got a bad rap as, as the last born kid, of course, that I was the whole time, right? But the thing is, is I have every right to be sad and pissed off and angry uh, about what happened to me as a child. You bet I do. And I have every right because that does not mean I can hurt other people because I'm because of this. It doesn't mean I should be hurting myself, right? That's the That's the disease. But what it does mean is I can be honest with myself about how I feel and then I can go ahead and I can cry about it. I can... I can write something down on paper. I can write exactly the words that I want to say, even if I don't give them to anybody or publish it or give it to my abusers. I can write exactly what I want to say and get all of this out and then tear that paper up and throw it away or keep it or whatever. You know, I can I can get angry. You know, I can't hurt. I, it won't do me any good to hurt somebody else or hurt myself. But I can learn how to channel this anger. There are lots and lots of ways that we can actually get emotionally honest with ourselves. And I've started to learn stuff, see, over the last, like, especially this last year, right? And so that's what I'm working on, right? And um, and it's it's healthy, let me tell you, because, I mean, there's nothing worse than somebody coming by, you know, and saying, oh, get over it. Can't you just get over it, you know? If we say, oh, well, I'm just down because, you know, I was thinking about, you know, something to do with, you know, with my past or whatever, they'd be like, well, just get over it. It's like, hmm, okay, you know what I mean? How about you live in my life for for and and experience what I've been through, and then we'll see how you're going to get over it. But I wouldn't wish that on anybody, right? That's the whole issue. Like, I wouldn't wish that on anyone, um, you know, not even my worst enemy. So that's the thing. We have a right to be sad. We have a right to to our own feelings and to our own emotions. We just have to learn how to handle and deal with them in a healthy way so that we don't hurt ourselves and hurt or hurt somebody else, right? Because we have a right to own these feelings, right? This is my experience, right? This is owning our feelings is the only way to own ourselves. So owning and healing ourselves is a gateway to reconnecting with our spiritual self, so that we can start, so that we can uh, start owning the unconditional love that is available to us, so that we can change our relationship with self 
into one that is based upon love instead of shame about being human. So owning our feelings is the only way to own ourself. And owning our owning and healing ourselves is a gateway to reconnecting with our spiritual selves. So it's quite interesting. Well, owning our feelings is the only way to own ourselves, I guess so. He says it's necessary to own and honor the child who we were in order to love the person we are. And the only way to do that is to own that child's experiences, honor that child's feelings, and release the emotional grief energy that we are still carrying around. So this is part of this um, inner child healing stuff. See, and the thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, to you know, necessary to own and honor the child who we were, that child who we were so long ago, who, who, for who you know, I mean, whether it was whether you know a person was physically abused or emotionally abused or sexually abused, you know, these little inner children, you know, they're still there, right? And they're still like I recognized one for sure who was still there because every time I looked in inward to myself and to my my own being, I could see this one girl, this one little girl who was me, probably about seven years old, I was thinking, so around seven or eight. And I, and I thought, that's her, that's my inner child. I could see it, you know, spiritually and, and just a, a, a picture in my mind of who I was then. And and the thing is, is, I had never really done any healing work, like inner child healing work before, and I wasn't even sure if I needed to. But I knew that this little inner person was raging, and I knew that a long time ago. This little inner inner person who I was so long ago was raging and really, really angry about what had happened to her as a child and what this whole mess, you know. So I knew about this inner child stuff. I just didn't know what I should do about it. <clears throat> you know, and so once I started looking into it, I started to realize that, wow, I have to get in touch with that part of myself um, from so long ago. I have to get back in there and, first of all, you know, um, learn how to talk and deal with this little inner wounded person and learn how to comfort and self-nurture, you know, and nurture her, nurture myself. And then I started to realize there was more and more than one. You know, I was like, well, I think there's more than one, but I don't know how many there are. Uh, but I could I could see myself, you know, I mean, as, as a teenager, right? And as an eight-year-old who was sexually abused. And, you know, this is these inner children that I needed to get a hold of and learn how to how to help them, because that's really honestly what is going on in, inside of me, is these little inner children are still so wounded. And they need, you know, I have to go back. I'm the only one that can do that, like John Bradshaw was saying. We're, like, really the only ones who can do this work, because we we're the only ones that really know where we were and what happened to us, right? So anybody else, like, can guide or help, you know, I mean, not anybody. I'm talking trust people, right, trustworthy people, whether it's a psychologist or a therapist or counselor or or for a friend right now, right? <clears throat> like I've got Gypsy, which you know she's helping me out. So, um, and other people too. You know, Donna, Donna, uh, lots, lots of people actually are helping me out. Not just, not just one. I mean, I've got a lot of people in my life who are helping me out. But Gypsy, which is particularly working with me, um, visualizations and stuff. So, the thing is, is, you know, I started to realize that I have to get in touch with these little people because I need to allow them first of all to, to experience those feelings in my consciousness because that's the only way that I'm going to really get in touch with how they're feeling and, and what they're you know what they're thinking and and why they're still this trap there these wounded little children and why you know they're still in so much pain it it's really sad that they got dumped off there you know what I mean so long ago and so what I think you know what I'm working on right now is is actually getting in touch with them I've got them in a safe place you know I'm working through uh, now what I got to do is allow myself, my inner self, which was these little children, these wounded parts of myself, express these feelings from stuff that I did that I suppressed. I just pushed it down, right? And so uh, it's been, right now I'm dealing with the with the CSA incest, and I need I haven't really done any of the work on it yet. You know what I mean? I'm just looking at it. I'm just looking at it because it's all I can handle right now. You know, I can't do the anger work on it right now. I can't even do the grieving work on it right now because I, I, I'm not ready for it. But the thing is, once when I'm when I am ready, I know that I need to go through these processes in in order to, for myself, my conscious self, right now in the now, to be able to feel better and and help this little inner person I was, who was so wounded. You know, so it's um. It's hard, and, and some people can't do it self-help. <clears throat> so, I mean, I would be very careful when you're doing that kind of work, right? And if you have to, like I never suggested, because I know there's people out there who can't do it, um, self-help. So I would say make sure you reach out to somebody who, who you trust, you know, 
like find somebody you who you trust. I would be very careful who you let into your life, right? As a survivor of abuse, there's a lot of sick people out there who like to take advantage of people who are who already are um, wounded and damaged, and because they're vulnerable and they know that they don't understand boundaries, they know that they can get their foot in the door real easily. Um, I'm I'm very cautious about who I deal with and who I allow into my life, and I think that everybody should be. <laughs> whether you're a survivor of abuse or not, right? Everybody needs to be careful who you let into your life because there's sadly enough there's a lot of really sick, diseased, twisted, evil minded people out there who ha- who have nothing else in their hearts but to hurt people. And so but they, they come across looking pretty good at first. So you you really have to get to know people and, and if you don't trust somebody, use your gut instinct. And if and make sure that you have some trustworthy people in your life. That's 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 I think really important. Reach out to some some reach out to the other survivors. If you're a survivor and you're listening to this, you know that's what I did. I reached out to survivors because I knew I was like, man, these people have been there. They know what it's like to be on this the receiving end of this garbage, and this abuse and this horror and horrific stuff. So they they know they and they are more than willing, usually, to give you a hand, right? And so I started reaching out to all kinds of these survivors and and people who are now my friends. And the thing is, it's so important to do that because these people will guide, you know, and, and, and help you to make friends and help you to make trustworthy friends and people who are decent and kind. And, you know, you want that. Like, you don't want to get involved with somebody to try to help you work through this inner child stuff or try to help you on your healing journey who's just going to take advantage of you, use you, cause you more pain and bring you further down than you already were, right? So be very, very careful when you're doing this stuff. You know, and I mean, if you have to get a counselor or a therapist or whatever, then then you do. For me, I'm perfectly happy and fine doing this self-help. But um, I made a commitment that I, I would not allow myself to spiral down. If I, like, if things weren't going, if I wasn't making progress and things were just getting worse, I was going to go get professional help because I refused to let this destroy me. I absolutely refused. And so the, it already destroyed my childhood. It destroyed my you know, who I was, you know, for so long. Like, I'm just now, at the age of, of 45, you know, going on 46, just now starting to find out who, like, really who I am. You know what I mean? Because I was just living in this nightmare of uh, of this life script my parents had created for me and my one of my siblings, right? This life script of, of I can take it, I can roll with the punches, you know, I don't, I don't need help, you know. Um, just, you know, suffering, just suffering, right? And so I'm so thankful that, you know, I was able to make the right decision for myself, really. And that's why I'm, I'm doing these shows. I mean, that's exactly why I'm doing these shows. It's not only just for me, but it's also to sort of, you know, to 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 encourage people to not ever give up and just keep, you know, keep looking keep, and be very, very cautious who you deal with and who you allow into your life, you know. So, you know, we, yeah, I mean, you know, we have to honor the child who we were. I have to honor that little child. I have to honor myself, you know, like... I look back at these little inner children and I think about the, the little inner child is about seven, eight years old, you know, and I think, I, I do, I just, I honor her and I honor her feelings, you know. I understand why she felt the way she does and why she felt the way she did and why I feel the way that I, I did at that time, you know. And so, you know, in order to love ourselves and really love our all of ourselves, all of the wounded parts, I guess is what all these people are talking about, all, loving all of these wounded parts, we have to get in there and and uh, honor the feelings, and honor that child's feelings. So that's what I'm working on with the um, with the eight year old with the with the child sexual abuse and incest. I'm, I have to go in and let her get her feelings out, and that's going to be harsh because you know I'm going to have to feel it with her too. So I'm going to have to let myself to feel what I went through at that age, right? And so you know that's been a long time now, and I don't necessarily want to go back there, but it's been haunting me my whole life. And I mean, I've I've got body memories going on right now, and, and all kinds of stuff, and it's 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 hard work. But you know what? At the end of it, there's going to be healing, and so that's to me, it's worth it, right? But you got to be very careful when you do this work, and I would say make sure you do reach out and get some help, you know. And if you just you know you call a crisis line if you have to, you do whatever you have to do, but you make sure you stick around, right? So thanks everybody for being here. We'll pick up uh, tomorrow. We're going to look at sharing experience, strength, and hope, taking action. The Recovery Process for Inner Child Healing Series Part 1 from Robert Bernie's web page is here. So we're going to go into that tomorrow. Thanks a lot for being here. appreciate it. I don't have a show tonight, so I'll be off tonight, and I'm actually going to take it easy and spend some time with my sweetheart. And um, good morning.
back on tomorrow morning. One child to be a survivor to another, and then I'll uh, tomorrow night I have my shows on Dreamcatchers as well. So take good care of yourselves. I will be checking my messages. So if you need something, get a hold of me here on Blog Talk Radio, Facebook, wherever. Um, you know, if you need any information that I might have, get a hold of me. You know, I don't mind, and and I'll try to get those those resources for you. And um, otherwise, we'll talk to you later. Have a good day. Bye bye. <laughs>